Okay, before we discuss um, Gauss's law using dielectrics, uh, what we want to do first is just go back to yesterday's lesson and solve a quick problem. All right, so suppose there's a one nanofarad capacitor is charged by a battery to a potential difference of 12 volts. A rectangular solid slab of Pyrex is designed to fit perfectly between the plates and the slab has a mass of two micrograms inserted between the plates. Uh, if it is allowed to oscillate between the plates, find the maximum velocity of the slab. Okay, this is assuming there's no interference, there's no friction. When it was first let go of, it was not shoved, it was literally gently let go of. Uh, so why would there be motion anyway? We talked about this yesterday. When you have a capacitor, it already has potential energy stored in the field. And then when you bring a dielectric in, it changes the amount of potential energies in the field. Okay? So there is some lost energy, I guess you could say. So let's take a look at some of the formulas we have. So we have, of course, uh, C equals Q over V. We now have a new one um, that for parallel plates anyway, V equals ED. Um, we have, what else do we have? Uh, U, well, work equals one half CV squared. I said that looks a lot like one half KX squared from the spring situation. It just looks that way to your eyes, you know. Um, you could also interpret this as U final minus U initial. It's the work done um, t when you're moving one charge uh, from one plate to the other and you do it one at a time. So I don't really like to think of it as U final minus U initial. I'm just going to leave it as work. Okay, that's the work done to even charge a capacitor. Okay, and many other formulas. So... Another one, I mean, you could like rewrite this one if you wanted to and just think of it as one half times Q over V times V squared. If you wanted to write it that way, you could. And then the V's cancel and you have one half QV. So there's just many ways to write it. Um, you could also insert the ED from V from earlier. So you could play around with it. One of the formulas we came across uh, yesterday was the potential energy is one half CV squared. Let's take a look at that one. And I don't know if I wrote it this way. Or I think I actually did write it this way. But yesterday we also wrote it as uh, one half times Q squared over C. That's like another way to write it. There's so many ways. Okay, so you guys are pretty familiar from physics one and uh, also mechanics that you can rewrite formulas all day long using new variables and stuff. Okay, so what I want to point out is that when you bring that slab in, it does change the capacitance value, right? So C without the slab, C without the Pyrex is given. It was one nanofarad, right? But C with the Pyrex inserted is different. It's going to be basically kappa for Pyrex times the capacitance without Pyrex. So whenever you introduce a dielectric, you basically multiply the old capacitance by this kappa value. Now you have to look up the kappa value for Pyrex. According to our textbook, the kappa value for Pyrex is 4.7. 4.7 C without Pyrex. Okay? All right, so because our formula has a C on the bottom, our potential energy has a C on the bottom, the initial potential in this system is when we had no Pyrex. Right? But the final situation Q hasn't changed. You haven't brought in more charges. You have simply added the Pyrex. So the only thing that's changing here is the C. Okay, so if you just look at a ratio, if you just divide these, U final over U initial, right? It's just going to be basically Q squared over 2C with divided by Q squared over 2C without. 
the fire X. And most everything cancels out. The Q squared, the two, the two does. And you just basically get this C without over C with. And since C with is really just kappa times C without, this reduces to one over kappa. Okay, so I mean, I kind of ran out of space. Maybe I, maybe I should put in one more step. I will extend the page and put in one more step just in case that was too quick. Okay, so I'll just do one more one more little stepper there. I was going to change the the um, C with to kappa C without. And so this cancels out. So that's why I was saying it's one over kappa. All right, now remember the whole purpose of a dielectric is to uh, question, is it to increase or decrease our capacitance? Okay, so if our potential energy ratio be after to before is one over kappa, you could also write that like this. The final potential energy is just the initial potential energy divided by kappa, right? Okay, so let's go back and let's see how many joules we have to work with. Uh, if you go back to the original problem, they said that it was a one nanofarad capacitor in a 12 volt potential difference. So that will help you find C without. Okay, so U initial is just gonna basically be, like we said, a one half C initial V squared. And then we're gonna end up dividing by kappa. Okay, so uh, let's go and find that numerator over here. One half times, and what is a nanofarad? It's one times 10 to the minus ninth, isn't it? Okay, so let's get out our calculator and let's type that thing in. So we kind of know how many uh, joules of energy are originally stored. So where's my calculator? There it is. So it's 144 over two. I think it's 72 times 10 to the minus ninth. I guess we don't need to calculate for that. So, yeah, this is 144. You divide it by 2 to the 72 times 10 to the minus 9th. It's 72 times 10 to the minus 9th. And that's joules, literally. Joules. Okay. Or you could say 72 nanojoules. That's not a lot of potential energy, but what did you expect? It's a capacitor. All right, it's not going to move mountains, okay? Uh, this is the numerator, and then the that means we have 72 nanojoules over kappa. This is our U final now. So now we do need a calculator, maybe. 72 divided by 4.7. Wasn't it 4.7? I thought so. Okay, so 4.7. Okay, so 72... Hold on one second. Mr. Soros having a little bit of trouble with his calculator today. I think I need to close my graphing software and try again. Where's my calculator? Okay. Uh, so from the home screen, uh, we were going to do 72 divided by 4.7. 15.319. So there's too many sig figs here, but that's okay. So 15.319 nanojoules. Okay, so we just dropped basically from 72 nanojoules to 15.319 nanojoules. So this was our initial potential energy. And our final potential energy is basically almost one-fifth of that. And you probably should just round it to 15, you know. So basically what that means is we lost some potential energy. So where the heck did it go? It goes into moving the block. So we ha now have, what, uh, 55 joules, micro uh, nanojoules of energy that is pure motion. Or it's mechanical energy anyway. It's mechanical energy. So I kind of said that wrong. Your potential energy originally and your potential energy final have a difference. And that is some mechanical energy with which to move the block. So let's go and find a difference real quick. Uh, I need to subtract 72, or I could do it the other way around. I have 56.68 nanojoules of energy. 
56.68. And this is allowed to be converted back and forth between potential energy and kinetic energy. You could think of this as the work required to stick the block in, to slide the thingy in. And I believe the work is actually done by the field because when you bring a dielectric into a capacitor that's already charged, I said this yesterday, the capacitor wants to suck that block in. So you'll feel the capacitor doing the work actually. For you, it's just easy. Um, to restrain it would require 56.7 nanojoules to just keep it from happening. Okay, so this is now able to be converted back and forth between kinetic and potential. And anytime you have that back and forth trading, you're going to get a bouncing effect. So the block is going to basically slide back and forth between the plates. It's going to slide back and forth um, with this much total mechanical to work with. So there are times when all of it will be potential. There are times when all of it will be kinetic. Maybe you can remember from your simple harmonic motion, when is the block at its greatest velocity? Is it when it's at an end point of travel? Or is it when it's at its middle? When does it have its most speed? Okay, so just by way of review, the block will be oscillating back and forth. Its largest kinetic energy will occur when it's in the middle of its motion. And it will have no kinetic energy out at the end points. All the energy will be po uh, potential. So we don't need to worry about that too much. We just have to remember that when it's at its maximum, um, velocity, the kinetic energy will be one half mv max squared, and there will be no potential energy, and this should equal the total amount of kinet, uh, a total amount of mechanical energy. Okay, so we have fifty six point six eight nanojoules to work with. The sum of kinetic and potential is always fifty six point six eight even when this is non-zero, but when the speed's its biggest, because the question says, what's the max velocity? That implies it's at the middle of its motion and there's no potential energy. You should be able to just basically ignore the potential energy then. Okay, so that gets ignored and you solve it. So we're gonna double it and then divide by mass. So it's gonna look like this. V max squared should be 56.68 nanojoules. Uh, this will get doubled because you're timesing by two. You're going to divide by m. Okay, now we just got to go back to the problem and look at our mass. Okay, so it was 2 micrograms. So we have to be careful with that. Yeah, so that's... This is 10 to the minus 9th joules. And then on the bottom, we have m equals 2 micrograms, which means 2 times 10 to the minus sixth grams a gram is 10 to the minus three kilograms <laughs> okay so it's two times ten to the minus ninth kg right uh did i do that correctly okay thank you just a little bit of accountability here uh so nice this it worked out better than i'd hoped um, the 10 to the 9th, negative 9th cancels out. You just basically get 56.68 joules per kilogram. That's not very meaningful. It's a velocity squared. So uh, we're going to square root anyway, right? Square root of 56.68 joules per kg. And now we'll get out our calculator one more time. Take the square root of that thing. 7.529. So V max is 7.529. And if you've been careful with units to use joules and kgs and volts and all the right MKS units, this should represent meters per second. You don't even have to worry about it. Okay, so is this realistic? Um, I don't know. I, I do not know. Uh, I'm not a materials scientist, so I don't know if you can... I know you can use Pyrex to make a to make a capacitor, but is it realistic to have a mass? Uh, is it is it geometrically possible to have a one 
what did I say? One um, nanofarad capacitor, and then squeeze in a piece of Pyrex that small. I, I, I didn't really think about all that part of it, okay? I just literally made this problem up. So, but theoretically, if, if all of this could be invented and built, this would be approximately your Vmax. Remember, there's friction, there's air drag, there's other components in the circuit that produce their own fields. The fields interfere, it messes up the motion. There's a lot more to this story, of course. But this is, in our perfect little situation, a pretty good approximation. All right. 